to the InfoWars Nightly News. It's Tuesday, June 3rd, 2014, and I'm Leanne McAdoo. Here's what's coming up tonight. Tonight, top experts agree Obama violated law in Bergdahl's negotiation. Then, will Holder's Terror Task Force investigate Operation Fast and Furious? And an intrepid teenage journalist leaves Pelosi at a loss for words. That's next on the InfoWars Nightly News. It's all about we're all off balance, we have no free speech, but government can do whatever it wants. Well, before I get into the latest regarding the release of Army Sergeant Bo Bergdahl, I just wanted to let you guys know that we are not falling for the divide and conquer tactic that is Bergdahl Gate. We will not forget, we will continue reporting on the scandal plaguing the White House prior to this scandal. Of course, I'm talking about the sorry state of affairs there at Veterans Affairs. It seems as if they were, you know, the Obama administration was kind of sitting there going, Hmm, the entire country is now rallying behind the veterans. Even the mainstream media is demanding that we do something about the poor quality of health care that these veterans are receiving. We had just done a really stellar job at convincing everyone that veterans were domestic terrorists. And now they're demanding that we do something about it. What can we do? And then boom, Bergdolgate. And so not only now are the veterans fighting amongst themselves rather than fighting the real enemy, the mainstream media is now talking about this storyline, the veterans affairs scandal has been pushed out of the headlines, and Obama thinks that he can now say, hey, look, veterans, I care about you. No soldier left behind. You know, we we're here fighting for you. And of course, that has now blown up in his face and is just another scandal to add to the scandals plaguing the Obama White House. Now, on to the Bo Bergdahl saga. There are so many questions with this story. One of those main questions is, did Obama trade five top Taliban commanders for an army deserter? Now, there is evidence to support that Bergdahl left on his own. Sergeant uh, Bo Bergdahl apparently left a note for his comrades in which he said, I did not want to fight for America anymore. I didn't believe in the war. And he said he was leaving to start a new life. Now, a soldier who spoke to Mail Online, who was uh, stationed in the same platoon as Bergdahl, made his feelings and those of his comrades very clear. He said, as far as I'm concerned, Bergdahl deserted his men and should face a court martial. People died trying to save him. He was a deserter. Now, in fact, Bergdahl was never officially listed as a POW. And then, of course, we have this flashback from 2010. There were reports that Bergdahl actually converted to Islam and was teaching the Taliban how to build bombs. Now, this article from 2010 reports Bo Bergdahl, there he is, they, they knew where he was at, and they said that this army soldier had converted to Islam and was teaching the Taliban ambush skills and how to make bombs using old cell phones. A Taliban deputy district commander in Paktika told a newspaper that most of the skills he taught us we already knew, but some of my comrades think he's pretending to be a Muslim to save himself so they wouldn't behead him. And, of course, that's very true. As uh, Staff Sergeant Joe Biggs pointed out, it's very odd he wasn't beheaded in those five years because that's what those guys do. But some, some outlets are reporting that even prior to this, Bergdahl had wanted to renounce his U.S. citizenship. But here's the disputed fact. Was he a deserter? Was he a prisoner? And they're saying now an Army secretary confirmed that they're going to be doing a full investigation into his 2009 disappearance. But that is insane. It makes it obvious that this is a distraction tactic because they knew where he was the entire time. And of course, all this new evidence that's surfacing is sure to pile even further pressure on Obama and, and the, the issue surrounding his error in judgment over releasing these five top Taliban commanders over what could possibly be a deserter who abandoned his unit and his oath that he took for the U.S. Army. So, of course, that's one of the big issues, as well as the fact that Obama did all of this without giving Congress 30 days notification. Um, obvious breach of the law there. Now, why did Obama do it? He said he did it because Bergdahl's life was in danger. But wasn't his life in danger the entire time over the last five years? 
What happened all of a sudden? What was the sudden change? Because the Pentagon knew where he was. The Pentagon had followed him that entire time. Uh, the special forces found Bergdahl and his captors on multiple occasions, even down to knowing exactly how many gunmen were surrounding Bergdahl. But they decided they wouldn't risk rescuing him. They didn't want to risk any more men for a deserter. So this is someone that they had been considering a, to be a deserter. Now, the AP also reports that the U.S. government kept tabs on Bergdahl's whereabouts with spies, drones, and satellites, even as they were pursuing these negotiations to get him back over the five years that he was being held in captivity. Now, of course, the decision was made, however, not to rescue him because they considered him a deserter and they didn't think that it was that he was worth risking any more lives. There's a lot of speculation going around about the Bo Bergdahl story. What the government says is that there was a combat patrol, Bo fell behind and the Taliban captured him. What the guys in his unit are saying is that he planned to leave. He left a note behind saying that he was fed up with the army and what was going on in Afghanistan and he was going on to start a new life. Now whether or not you believe Bo Bergdahl is a hero or a deserter doesn't matter. What we do know is that men lost their lives looking for him. How would you feel waking up, doing roll call, and finding out that one of your brothers is missing? You would do anything you could. You would search day and night looking for him, just like those men did. And men died. And now five years later, they, come to, they, they find out that not only did he desert them, but their brothers died for nothing. Just think about that. Yesterday, I was scrolling through Facebook, and I was invited to a uh, page. And apparently, it was started by a lot of the members from his old unit and it was called Bo Bergdahl is not a hero. And it was very interesting, I was scrolling through and I saw an image that a wife had put up and it was of her husband beside the wheelchair with his daughter and he is permanently injured. He got her looking for Bo. There's a lot of people that are very upset about him leaving, so I just want people to understand their side of the story as well. I know it's easy to get caught up in emotion and think, you know, he's back, we should just leave him alone. That's understandable. But just stop for a minute, put emotion aside, and look at the facts. Soldiers from Bo's old unit were told not to speak about the events of Bo Bergdahl's capture. Now that's just very odd. You know, to, to, not, to be told by the government you can't talk about this, and why is that? They were also forced to sign non-disclosures. Now soldiers from Bo's old unit are starting to speak out. A lot of them said they're glad that he's back. That's understandable. He's been away from his family for five years. He deserves to be back home. But once he's better, what they want is justice. And it's not hard to, to believe that that's how those guys would feel. You know, people died. Of course, he should stand trial. He should be account held accountable for his actions. That's not wrong to think. So stop being emotional. Stop being hateful to people who do want justice for the lives that were lost. And even further evidence that this is just a distraction tactic and for whatever reason they're whipping the media into a frenzy of trying to decide was he a deserter or is he a hero, is he a traitor, they knew the entire time this is how they see him. And in fact, a senior official confirmed to Fox News that intelligence agencies were investigating Sergeant Bergdahl prior to his capture by the Taliban. They confirmed that the conduct of Bergdahl, both in his final stretch of active duty in Afghanistan and during his time when he was living amongst the Taliban, was thoroughly being investigated by the U.S. intelligence community and is the subject of a major classified file. Indeed, that's exactly what we've been saying, was probably the major classified file that Hastings was working on that got him killed. Now, of course, in conveying as much, the Defense Department source confirmed that Many within the intelligence community harbor serious outstanding concerns, not only that Bergdahl may have been a deserter, but that he may have been an active collaborator with the enemy. But, you know, this is, of course, all of a sudden a, a surprise. And so Obama is going to release five top Taliban commanders in exchange for this person who has a major classified file. Now, basically, they're admitting that force could have been used to secure Bergdahl. Uh, they knew where he was, but they didn't want to risk it because he was a deserter, which is something that they also knew. So why all of a sudden did the administration opt to negotiate with terrorists? a policy that we have had for quite some time, all of a sudden now we are negotiating with terrorists. 
course, we mentioned that could it have something to do with the fact that there was a CIA agent whose cover was inadvertently blown, inadvertently blown a few weeks ago? Or, of course, did this just happen to occur conveniently to give Obama an opportunity to, you know, give the veterans a win to say, hey, guys, I'm on your side. Look, here's your soldier that you've been wanting returned. No soldier left behind. Just forget about that VA scandal, um, you know. If that is the case, because this is something that's obviously the VA scandal is something that's going to affect both sides, the left and the right. Um, if they did this for politics, that is a very dangerous and reckless decision that Obama made, not to mention that it was illegal. Uh, is there the possibility of uh, some of them trying to return to uh, activities that are detrimental to us? Absolutely. That's been true of all the prisoners that were released from Guantanamo. So Obama knows that he made a reckless decision, that there could potentially be, you know, a little bit of a terror attack fallback from this decision. Um, but he wants us to feel better knowing that they're not going to be able to move outside of the country of Qatar. You know, with this deal, the Taliban commanders, they're going to have to stay inside of Qatar for one year. Well, Qatar has now just announced that it's moved the men to a residential compound and it's going to let them move freely about the country. Uh, a Gulf official said that the Taliban men have been granted Qatari residency permits and they will not be treated like prisoners while in Doha. And no U.S. officials will be involved in monitoring their movement while in the country. And then, of course, you know, after this, they're going to be free to go wherever they please after this year. So, what I mean, is that supposed to make us feel safe that these guys can just move freely about and no one is actually monitoring their activities? Do they not realize that, you know, they're they're going to have access to cell phones and computers and, you know, courier service? I mean, they're not cutting off anyone else's access to these men. They're moving about freely in the country. So, of course, this is very dangerous. And Obama knows that this is very dangerous. And it's, uh, you know, there could be future fallback from releasing these men. Now, Judge Andrew Napolitano has called for the impeachment of the president over this Taliban prisoner release, and he's stating that now the president has aided in the release of the worst terrorists in the world. I have argued that by letting these people free and their natural and probable be results of them being let free is that they will rejoin these uh, this terrorist organization. The president has done what his Justice Department has prosecuted people for, successfully right. prosecuted people for, providing material assistance to a terrorist organization. Couple issues. Now, Napolitano said that this latest impeachable offense is that the president and his team violated the federal statute which makes criminal providing material assistance to a terrorist organization. This includes money, could include making maps, including professional services, and it includes releasing human assets back to a terrorist organization. So clearly an impeachable offense. Now in 2013, Jay Carney said, oh, we would not make any decisions about transfer of any Guantanamo detainees without consulting with Congress and without doing so in accordance with US law. But that was 2013, Jay Carney. Obviously that is not what happened here, but everyone wants to say that it's okay because Obama wrote himself a note. He issued a signing statement, so it's okay. Now, obviously, Obama clearly broke the law, and as I mentioned before, even Obama supporters are now turning against him. Liberal Harvard professor and CNN legal analyst Jeffrey Tubin turned on the president Monday, telling a surprised Wolf Blitzer that Obama clearly broke the law by failing to provide Congress 30 days notice before releasing five high-level Taliban prisoner. So that's, you know, in addition to this other impeachable offense. Now, he continued that the president issued a signing statement, basically echoing what Jay Carney said as well. Oh, you know, he issued himself a signing statement, but a signing statement is not the law. A signing statement is basically the president writing his opinion of what the law should be while he is breaking that law. So he's like, I'm breaking the law, but here's how you guys should interpret it. And then he 
thinks that he can just get away with it and no one's ever going to hold him to task. He's negotiated with terrorists. Now he's provided assets to terrorist organizations. He set a dangerous precedent that now puts a price on the head of all American soldiers and, you know, admits that there is absolutely a possibility that the release of these Taliban commanders could result in an attack on America once again. So what more can this man do while he is in office to get himself impeached? He is truly pushing the envelope as far as he possibly can. But this leads us to another thing that is kind of tied up, wrapped up in this whole Bergdahl thing. The white Al-Qaeda agenda. This is something that they've been hyping up. We've been warning you about this for years, and they've really been hyping this up in the last year or so, for sure, trying to convince everyone that the veterans are domestic terrorists and that there's you know, home, homeland, homegrown terrorists. And this is, of course, justifying the need to beef up their homeland security um, because of these potential domestic terrorists. Well, now, Attorney General Eric Holder has just unveiled this week his plan to create a new Justice Department task force that will focus on the threat of homegrown terrorism. Now, this was in a video posted to the department's website on Monday which was, of course, later removed, Eric Holder said, we face an escalating danger from self-radicalized individuals within our own borders. As the nature of the threat we face evolves to include the possibility of individual radicalization via the internet, it's critical that we return our focus to potential extremists here at home. And of course, just ramping this up, creating the need for the facial recognition database that the NSA is collecting, um, all of their spying that they're doing, their surveillance, letting us know that there are these potential terrorists and now there's some new leaders uh, back to replenish the ranks in the Taliban. So, you know, on, constantly on red alert for a terrorist attack. But <clears throat> Holder went on to use the example of the Boston Marathon bombers as an example of potential domestic terrorists. But again, the FBI knew about the Boston bombers and failed to stop that or any other domestic terror plots. And in fact, they are known to create most of the terror plots so that then they can come and save the day. But it's just like they knew and they've been knowing for the last five years where Bo Bergdahl was and that he was a, a deserter, possibly you know, aiding the terrorists. And so they wait to rescue him until it's conveniently timed to help, you know, take the light off of the scandal plaguing the veterans affairs. Um, so they knew all of this the entire time. And instead of doing something about it, uh, they release these top five <laughs> Taliban commanders knowing that they're likely to propagate to some new recruits. Mm -hmm. And that's just it. It's order out of chaos. They need all of this chaos to justify the prison planet that they are building all around us. They need these domestic terrorists to justify the need to beef up homeland security, to convince us that we all need to get grabbed by the TSA in the streets, um, and that they need more money and they need war because it justifies the military industrial complex. And that's why they've got this latest distraction and we're going to get to the bottom of it because it's, there's just too many questions, um, you know, but basically we've been telling you they want us all to be lined up. We're all domestic terrorists. If anyone has a, uh, you know, disagreement with the political agenda, we are now the enemy. Now, coming up, I'm going to talk to you about the NSA and their latest efforts to build a huge facial recognition database. They're basically stealing your photos. And then you are not going to want to miss Nancy Pelosi's reaction to a tough question posed by a teenager. That's coming up right after this. Well, according to documents leaked by Edward Snowden, the NSA is intercepting millions of images every day via the internet, including 55,000 facial recognition quality images. Now, the agency has uh, turned to some new software that helps them exploit the flood of images included in emails, text messages, social media, video conferences, and other communications on its mission of tracking suspected terrorists. 
Now, according to the NSA's new director, their use of this facial recognition uh, stays within the legal boundaries. We can trust them to <laughs> obey the laws there. Now, according to him, he says the NSA doesn't access motor vehicle or passport databases to examine images of U.S. citizens. So basically, he's assuring us that the he, the, the NSA doesn't go into these existing government databases that are already set up. Basically, they are intercepting these images by surreptitiously breaking into your emails and your Skype feeds and stealing these images. Um, he says that whenever they come across the potentiality that they're you know, tracking and monitoring someone with a U.S. connection, they stop. Right. But then he goes on to echo which is quite possibly what was being discussed at Bilderberg this last weekend, the issue of privacy. And of course, he is now spouting what's going to be the new argument that citizens just need to come to terms with all of this spying. He says, the idea that you can be totally anonymous in the digital age is increasingly difficult to execute. But that is not a satisfactory solution. Just deal with it, just get used to it. Maybe that's okay to the lapdog media that's gonna start pushing out this message, but that's not okay with us here at InfoWars, and it's not okay with the young Andrew Demeter. He is the 16-year-old investigative journalist that's fighting the new world order, one tough question at a time. We've interviewed Andrew here on the show before, and he's made some great documentaries um, for the Truth Movement. And you know, due to those really great documentaries, he was a winner of the Student Cam Documentary Competition put on by C-SPAN. And one of their big prizes they had was getting to meet <laughs> Nancy Pelosi. Well, Andrew used his opportunity to confront Nancy Pelosi about her stance on the NSA's overreach. Why do you support the NSA's illegal and ubiquitous uh, data collection? Well, I, I do not. I have questions about the metadata collection that they were uh, collecting, unless they had a reason to do so. Uh, so I found I was one. From, I, did, I didn't support. I didn't support Amash that resolution. I didn't think that was the appropriate resolution. Uh, but I do think that the burden is on the the uh, department and I have fought them for years, on the community, fought them for years on the wide swath that they have put out there. You did vote for a bill to continue funding for the NSA, though? Yeah, of course. I don't think we should not fund the National Security Agency. No, they do many, isn't, many things. Isn't the NSA a clear Thank violation of the Fourth Amendment? No, no. Some of what they should, what they do should be subjected to scrutiny in some of the things, but they perform many other functions as well and uh, we hold them to a high order. And I've had my biggest fight here in, in the intelligence community with the director of the NSA, uh, Hayden, when he was the director, I don't think he was on the level with us. But that doesn't mean that there aren't other things that are there uh, that, are, uh, that are good things uh, that, are, that are necessary for us to have. But from 9-11 on, the Bush administration went too far on all of these things, and, and uh, we have the correspondence back and forth to prove or to demonstrate that they were just doing the wrong thing. Oh, Nancy Pelosi, did you see the look on her face? She was just stuttering. Someone's getting fired. She's like, who let this thinker in here? Now, Andrew is much braver than me. Uh, obviously, a great example for the next generation. Uh, Demeter said, if I a shy, socially inept high school student can expose on a global scale the paradox that is politics by asking nothing more than a question, then so too can you. And he is absolutely right. Those are wise words. That is exactly what we must do. And that's, of course, what we try to do every single year when we cover the Bilderberg meetings. And this year, our reporters on the ground actually got the opportunity to speak to a Bilderberger and find out what goes on behind the closed doors of that shadowy conference. Now that is coming up right after this. David Knight for InfoWars. We're here live in Copenhagen for the 2014 Bilderberg meeting and this is basically the end. The last of the delegates have pulled away it's a bit after 3 o'clock in the afternoon. This has been an unusual Bilderberg conference in the sense that we were so close to where they were. It was in a smack dab in the middle of a very busy city. 
as opposed to being out in a remote resort with golf courses where people were very far away. So we were able to get quite a bit of close-up footage of them arriving, of them departing, of them having their meetings on the outside. And of course, as Watson pointed out, they had their bizarre charm offensive where one politician, Samsung, who is a uh, member of parliament from the Netherlands, he's the leader of the Labor Party, he came out several times to engage the public, to engage the press. Was it anything of substance? We did hear him make some interesting admissions about some things that were not on the agenda. So, uh, but Do you have a presentation about uh, I, renewable I'm, energy? I don't know enough about, oh, about renewable energy, I should have, but that's not on the, that's not our main topic on the agenda. No. What's your favorite topic then so far? My favorite topic? I think it's the uh, discussion about privacy. Really? Does yeah. privacy exist or should privacy exist? It should exist and it's diff more, even it's getting more difficult to, to keep it. For who? Us or you guys? Well, for me because you're following me with a You're camera. in the public place. <laughs> yeah, for you, you're in the public place too. Now why are we here? We're here because we want people to understand that Bilderberg exists. We want them to understand the agenda. For many decades, of course, it was laughed at if anyone suggested there was even such a group as Bilderberg. We're hoping by documenting the fact that it really exists, that we really see these people going in and out of these meetings, we're hoping that now that people are accepting that it's there, that they start to question whether or not this is really just some benign meeting. This is a meeting that they have pushed very hard for decades to keep secretive. And now we see the fruits of what they've been planning for a long time. As Davignon has said, they, he took credit for creation of the European Union and the Euro back in 1955. People in Europe are not happy with the fruits of what happened there. Daniel Esselin told people well before we saw the town turn in America that they were going to pump and dump the mortgage market in America, create a banking crisis. We've seen the fruits of what's happening in America. We keep showing these secretive organizations, we keep showing that the U.S. government is planning and preparing and creating scenarios and training sites for internal unrest. People need to collect, connect these dots and understand what's going on. And that's what we hope will come of this Bilderberg meeting. The fact that, as we saw with Ed Balls trying to sneak in with a suitcase full of paperwork, this is not just a social meeting. Now, of course, one of the topics that they put out there in their released agenda was, does privacy exist? That's an odd question for somebody, and many people point out the irony of Keith Alexander and General Petraeus, a former director of the CIA, being at a conference where they're asking, does privacy exist? Of course, Google, Palantir are also there, the data mining co corporations. They don't believe that privacy exists because they've done everything they can to take it away. And that's why we see Ed Balls sneaking in with paper information. That's why they need to meet in a hotel that has had everyone removed for days in advance so they can go over it for any listening devices, any bugging devices. They want to meet face to face. They want to exchange information with paperwork because they know that there is no security, there is no privacy in the electronic world. They are not concerned about their personal safety. That's not what these barricades are for. We captured them over and over again, going out one by one, jogging through the city. If they were concerned that they were going to be attacked or kidnapped or shot in the streets, they would be going with partners or bodyguards. They would have a police escort. That wasn't what was happening here. They were going on strolls individually, going shopping, going jogging. That was one of the reasons we were able to get such good pictures of that. What they're concerned about is the information. They want to keep that from you, just as they're keeping the information from you as they negotiate these Trans-Pacific and Transatlantic partnerships in secret. In a scenario that exactly mirrors the way they have created the European Union and the EU, that is the way these elite bankers, industrialists, multinational corporations, politicians, and generals operate in secret. Well, that's it for this conference, but stay tuned because I know more information is going to be surfacing as people start to blow the whistle on Bilderberg 2014. David Knight for Infowars.com. Thank you for tuning in to the show tonight. We'll see you here tomorrow at 7 p.m. Central. Well, Dr. Edward Group, thank you so much for joining us once again in the InfoWars studio. Now, we've been talking about the war on women and this full-on assault with all the estrogen mimickers and the plastics and the water, all the pharmaceuticals they're pushing. 
But this isn't really affecting only women. It's also affecting relationships. Can you tell me exactly what is this doing to our relationships between our men and women? Well, it started, you know, especially heavily about 10 or 15 years ago, and you have to look at the combination of hormone or endocrine disrupting chemicals that we're exposed to on a daily basis. It's happening the same for males as well. I mean, we're seeing low sperm counts, and what it translates to is estrogen dominance, and that's from... Uh, especially with females, all the cosmetic products that they use, the hair care products, because what they're doing is they're smearing all these lotions all over their body one or two times a day, then spraying perfumes, putting on makeup, and those contain estrogen mimickers, and ex it actually enhances the estrogen inside their system. So their estrogen levels go way up here, and their progesterone levels go way down here. High estrogen levels are going to translate into uh, cystic breasts, ovarian problems, endometrial problems, uh, women hormonal problems, mood swings, uh, menstrual cycles altered, uh, fatigue, brain fog, I mean the list goes on and on including hypothyroidism and everything else. So what's happening is we're seeing an increase in divorce rates, we're seeing an increase in relationship problems and if you look at the root cause of that you can trace it back to iodine deficiency and you can trace it back to all these artificial hormones and the effects that these estrogen mimickers are having also besides personal care products you have the high levels of pesticides in water roundup atrazine you have the plastics the bpa which are in microwave foods. If you're using your microwave, you're going to be exposed to them because most people cook with plastic containers. Any type of canned food, anything that's in plastic or lined with, even metal cans are all lined with BPA coatings in them. So all of these things are going to disrupt the hormone patterns and that's leading to couples not getting along, either the loss of libido in the male, the loss of libido in the female, the low testosterone levels in males, the low testosterone levels in females. I mean, all of these hormones and these glands are becoming altered because of the environmental toxins that we're exposing ourselves to on a daily basis. So the solution is that you need to first of all recognize these toxic compounds in your diet, in the foods that you're eating, in the beverages that you're drinking, any beverage that you're putting in your body that's in an aluminum can, probably it has some BPA in it. The water that you're drinking is very important because there's so much estrogen in water now because of so many women on birth control pills mm -hmm. that 85% of the estrogen gets urinated out and it goes back into the water supply and then everybody drinks it including males and males are also getting um, female breasts and they're getting excess weight gain and this feminization of males is going on and the masculinization of females because the hormones end up being a little bit different so what I recommend is people do their research and try to avoid any of the tap water, switch over to organic foods, switch over to natural cosmetics that don't have these endocrine disrupting chemicals inside of them, start detoxifying their body on a regular basis, and look at products that can naturally regulate the hormonal balance or products that will teach the body how to regulate their its own hormones because everybody has a self-healing mechanism inside themselves so really when you look at when anything's wrong with the body you try to look at the root cause and figure out what's causing those problems in this case it's the estrogen mimickers get a list of those look online eliminate those from your diet and then help the body by using natural substances so the body can naturally balance out the relationship between the different hormones such as growth hormone testosterone DHEA melatonin serotonin things like that mm -hmm. well and I know you spent a lot of time in the lab working on super male vitality and we have a lot of women that actually said that they took a, the super male and had a little bit of it, it affected me actually um, and you kind of heard the call and so you spent a little time in the lab working on something for the women well because we just had you know the relationship and the couples whether you're in a relationship or not 
you know, everybody's having hormonal issues. I mean, even the children now, as, as little as three or four, are having hormonal issues. But we had such good success with super male vitality that the women kept calling our office saying, hey, what about me? You know, all of a sudden my husband is walking around like a caveman and, you know, his libido's gone up, his energy level's gone up, he's starting to lose that extra weight, he's confident in himself again. What do you have for us? You know, I want something too. I mean, this isn't fair. So we spent some time in the lab and kind of reformulated the product a little bit to let it focus more on women and came out with the newest product, which is super female vitality. So now the husband and the wife or, you know, in a relationship or even single individuals can use the individual product to help stabilize and enhance their life in certain ways. In other words, you know, it might increase their libido or it might give them that extra spark in the bedroom or it might decrease the symptoms that you may be having to where you can get along better, you can talk better. Because a lot of times when your hormones are out, you might go through periods of rage and anger and mood swings. So by balancing the hormones naturally, not synthetically when people go in and get hormone shots or some sort of synthetic hormone, we're actually trying to teach the body's self-healing mechanism how to come back into balance. So it really creates a synergistic relationship between the male and the female in a relationship environment or even a boyfriend or a girlfriend, or for that matter, even if you want to use or balance out something on your own. So it's really a perfect fit for a male to use super male vitality or a female to use super female vitality especially since we're exposed to all these endocrine disrupting chemicals and all these estrogen mimickers in our environment. And so what sets this apart from all of the other female vitality products out on the market? Well, you know, there's a lot of male vitality products on the market. Yeah. It's like the, and the, the big push right now by the pharmaceutical companies is the low T centers everywhere, the, testosterone, the artificial testosterone, the artificial hormones, the hormone replacement therapy really because they know, and through the testing of all the males and all the females, they're seeing the low sperm count. They're seeing the infertility. This is another thing in couples, which how many couples do you know now that have been trying to get pregnant and haven't been able to get pregnant? And so what do they do? They send them to fertility clinics and then inject them and do IVF and everything else. Instead of addressing the root cause of the problem, which is both of their hormones are out of whack. The male can't produce enough sperm. The sperm average sperm count has gone down 50% in males. As a matter of fact, a lot of times with infertility, it's the male and not the female mm -hmm. that is the problem. So all these companies are trying to come out with these products that will enhance your sperm and do all this. But when you really trace it back, and you call these companies and you ask them where they're getting their herbs from, a lot of them are getting herbs from China or India or some contaminated area and they're not high strength or they're not strong enough to give you a therapeutic uh, dose to where it's actually going to make a difference in the body. And they sell these things for extremely high prices usually $100, $200, $300 like that. So what I wanted to do was find the best sources of herbs that we know that have the highest strength and put them all together in a vegetable glycerin base in unison through a proprietary extraction technique. We don't extract, we don't use alcohol at all because alcohol in itself is an endocrine disruptor and put these in a system, use a system that's designed to actually bond all these herbs together to create a high potency formula that's probably five to 10, maybe even 20 times stronger than anybody else would have as far as taking a product to support the body's normal functioning and hormonal balance. So I guess the, the cost cutting is one of the reasons why companies would wanna go with a subpar product, but why do, you, why do you think they would choose to go with a synthetic molecule than rather using something all natural? Well, there's more money in it and they can charge the insurance carriers. So, uh, you know, anything that's pushed into, that's why, you know, they'll have natural products that come out that are work really good and then the pharmaceutical companies will take it and patent it and then they'll try to resist 
or suppress the natural components. So a lot of these, the testosterone and the artificial hormones and the estrogen, look at birth control pills. They're trying to put young girls on birth control pills now at 13, 14, and 15. Well, what that does is it increases their estrogen even more. It increases their, can their cancer rates even more. So what they're trying to do is create, and they can actually sell them the product and get them sick at the same time. Right now, they're doing the same thing for males with testosterone and growth hormone because a male's testosterone and hor growth hormone and DHEA level starts to decline after the age of 28. So they find what's going on in the problem and then they create a system to sell you money behind it and that's what the HRT is or the hormone replacement therapy is. Then what happens is you have a bunch of natural companies that want to jump on the bandwagon and it's all about money, the same thing. There's very few companies out there that want to do it the right way because it takes a lot of time, takes a lot of devotion to research and development and it takes a lot of money to do a good really consistent product with testing and everything else. So what these companies will do is they'll just go online and look at 10 different supplements that are geared towards female vitality or libido and they'll just take the top two herbs of each one of them and say okay well that'll probably work since all those other companies are doing it. They put them in to their formula and then they label it something and when they go to purchase the herbs they look at 20 different suppliers and they pick the cheapest one because it's all about money. Well, if you pick the cheapest one, that, that herb might have sat in a warehouse for 10 years at 200 degrees and even though you get the powder in your hands and it says this is the herb, maca root or whatever, it might have zero constituents or the active ingredients left in it. They're all oxidized out so it's not any good anymore. So we have to look for the best ones, test them, make sure that they're clean, and then they're fresh, they have the constituents, and then bond them in a way they're not gonna lose their potency. So I'm really excited to see the results that I have in my own life. So tell us where we can go to get our hands on the new Super Female Vitality. Well, right now at InfoWarsLife.com, there's a limited supply available, so I highly recommend everybody go on as soon as possible and purchase some for themselves. Celebrate the spirit of freedom and liberty upon which our nation was founded at InfoWarsShop.com. Molon Lave is ancient Greek for come and take it. This popular design combines both classic Greek Spartan imagery with modern M16 assault rifles. Now available in women's tees and proudly made in the USA. Celebrate the spirit of 1776 with the George Washington brass belt buckle or this incredibly sharp looking 1776 hat. Badass. And be sure to check out the new arrivals at InfoWars Life, where you can prepare your body to perform at peak levels with Survival Shield Nascent Iodine, Super Male Vitality, and Fluoride Shield. And wake up, America. Immune Support Blend is the healthy choice for the gourmet coffee lover. So get incredibly high-quality, freedom-based products and help fund the revolution at InfoWarsShop.com. You are watching the InfoWars Nightly News, which airs 7 p.m. Central at InfoWarsNews.com. Members can share their passcodes with up to 11 other people, and your support is helping us defend liberty worldwide.